So my name is Kate Stevens, and on behalf of myself and Maria Soler, I welcome you to the second in the Green Nephrology e-seminar series. We are trying to um, always ensure that we deliver what you are interested in, and so we have an e-survey that will appear at the end of our discussion today, and it'd be great if you could fill that in in order that we can make sure we are delivering what you wish. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Muntzel, who is the Chief of Cardiology at the University Medical Centre at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany. Prof Muntzel is an interventional cardiologist and also a vascular biologist who has an interest in endothelial function and oxidative stress. And over the last few years, his research interests have focused on environmental risk factors for cardiovascular disease, with a particular focus on aircraft noise and air pollution. So without further ado, I hand over to Professor Munsell. Actually, I, I couldn't hear you very well, so... I think your introduction is finished, or is that fine? Yes, if, if you could share your slides, we're looking forward to your presentation. Very good, very good. So the connection is not very good, but I hope that I can bring over the message to you. And uh, I want to split my screen. So first of all, I have to tell you that I'm not a nephrologist, so don't be too disappointed if uh, I don't touch the, the renal part too strong. But as a cardiologist, I have to admit one of the first questions I always have to my patients or to my doctors taking care of patients, what is the creatinine of the patient? So, so because I think uh, the creatinine per se is one of the most important determinant which uh, determines how long the patient will stay in the hospital. And of course, we need to have very low uh, hospital stay length. Uh, so uh, we want to throw out the patient as soon as possible. But the creatinine, the kidney function, of course, is something where we have to fight uh, with as cardiologists. Now, um, what I have to do today is uh, to talk to you about environment, environmental stressors, and you gave me the title, The Dark Cloud of Air Pollution. <clears throat> I want to add noise as an environmental stressors too, because um, that's one we started with taking care of the environment. We, we were looking what, what kind of um, side effects noise has on the cardiovascular system, on mental functions, and uh, talking about noise or studying noise, actually we switched then over to, to air pollution. And now I'm very interested in, in um, let's say healthy city design because 80% of the people are living in cities. There is where air pollution is generated, where noise is generated. Outside light, for example, is a very modern uh, novel cardiovascular risk factor. So, what I want to do is give you a comprehensive uh, overview, and I promise I also have some uh, renal slides included. Um, so one exciting point for me is that, uh, of course, you have always to com combine noise and air pollution. Yeah. So um, when you talk about noise on the streets, or uh, if you want to talk about aircraft noise, you always have to consider that there is a lot of air pollution produced. So research suggests that the social costs of noise and air pollution in the European Union, including death and disease, could be nearly 1 trillion euro. For comparison, the social costs of alcohol and uh, smoking are much, much less. I think that's, that's a very important point. So what, that's what it means, 1 trillion. Um, and um, with respect to air pollution, let me start with a very historic slide. It's from 1952, the killer fog in London, which actually cost uh, 12,000 lives. Um, and uh, there was a long discussion what is responsible for this uh, very high death toll number. But at the end, it came out it may be particulate matter 2.5, which was responsible for this high uh, death rate. Now. 
where are where is the air pollution coming from? So we have the natural sources, we have the lightning, the volcanoes, and wildfires, which is getting more and more uh, important. I think um, if you watch California, of course, you understand what I'm talking about. Of course, we have uh, oil and gas and, and fertilizers. That's maybe an important point in particular for Germany. We have the cities. I told you that 80% of the people are living in cities and um, in 2050, we will have 10 billion people worldwide and 80% of those are living in cities and doing noise and, and uh, air pollution and all the other stuff, which actually um, is responsible for that uh, we get mainly cardiovascular disease. We have the industry and power plants and we have the mobile mobile uh, industry with the airplanes and the cars and trucks. Now, I like this slide very much because it already indicates in 2015 that back going back to 1990, ambient particulate matter air pollution was a very important risk factor for death. It was placed number four. Yeah, when you had household air pollution from solid fuels, this was mainly in India and Pakistan, where you had the, your house fires uh, just in front of you, take, being responsible for, for excess death. But ambient particulate matter pollution plays four. And uh, it was ranked number five in 2015. There's not a big change. And what is just ahead of ambient particulate matter pollution? It's high systolic blood pressure, which is also important for a nephrologist, smoking high glucose and cholesterol levels. So the typical cardiovascular risk factors are in front, but then uh, the next is ambient particulate matter pollution. This is very interesting because when you read the prevention guidelines from the American Heart Association uh, or from uh, European Society of Cardiology, um, air pollution is hardly mentioned. And, and that was what is mentioned at the end is just rubbish. So it doesn't help you at all to, to um, get any indication how you can fight this um, very serious risk factor for death. And when we check what kind of death are occurring in response to um, air pollution, then we see a strong increase in chronic ischemic heart disease and its stroke from 1990 to 2015. And um, WHO actually calculate that we have excess death of 4.2 million uh, worldwide in 2015. Now, just to give you an example, a uh, paper published in New England Journal, that when you have 12 microgram per cubic meter, that's actually the limit, air pollution limit in the US. If you increase the air pollution levels, that uh, the relative risk for death from cardiovascular disease will increase substantially. And it's also interesting, a paper also published in New England Journal from Germany, showing when you had exposure to traffic just before reaching the emergency department with a myocardial infarction, that the exposure to traffic, which means uh, riding a bike or driving a car or being in the bus, uh, is a very important risk factor for future uh, myocardial infarction. Now, what does it mean when we talk about air pollution? So we, ha we have the gaseous and the solid comp components. We have nitrogen dioxide, which is an important issue in Germany. We have ozone and we have the particulate matter, different sizes, 10 microns, 2.5 microns and 0.5 microns, which is also called the ultrafine particulate matter. And you can see that if you have 10 microns, it's the size of a cell. 2.5, it's more the size of a red blood cell. And if you have 0.1, it's very interesting, you have a size of a virus. So, so the, it's also called the ultrafine particles. And in general, we believe that the smaller the particle, the more likely is the penetration of, of tissue, uh, um, the brain, for example, and the lungs and, and the vessels causing then cardiovascular disease and, and other diseases, lung disease mainly. Now, we had a an, an review article in the European Heart Journal. This was, uh, let's say, in 2018. <clears throat> and this slide nicely summarizes uh, the, how particulate matter actually can cause cardiovascular disease. And now what I want to say is that from, from the 
um, air pollution side of you, that particulate matter is, is the bad guy. Yeah, it's in my mind, NO2 is important. It's doing some problems. Patients having pulmonary disease, but the bad guy is indeed particulate matter. And the best characterized one is 2.5, but everybody is talking about nanoparticles without knowing what nanoparticles are actually doing. So when you inhale particulate matter, if you have a very small size, it can go directly into the brain and activate the hypothalamic pituitary axis and then causing directly, for example, an increase in blood pressure. It can cause an autonomic imbalance, but it can be also inhaled into the lungs. And it's very important, the smaller the particle, the more likely the particle, the transmigrate into the bloodstream, taken off by blood vessel and the particulate matter in the blood vasculature actually causing inflammation and all these processes which are summarized here. So we have, for example, a dysfunctional nitric oxide synthase. It makes superoxide instead of nitric oxide, you get more endothelin, you get activation of uh, other superoxide producing enzymes like the NADPH oxidase. You have more inflammatory cells. And at the end, you have all the stuff you don't want. You have less vasodilation, more vasoconstriction, more proliferation and more inflammation. The important point is to know what does it mean particulate matter. So we have a, a carbon core that's very important. That determines the size of the particle. But, but what makes us sick is the stuff which is sitting on the particle. And these are transition metals. These are endotoxins, quinones or reactive aldehydes. And some people discuss that even the coronavirus is sitting on these particles. And so that may be... Um, let's say particulate matter is acting as, as, as a super spreader. So this is a very, very important point. I'll just give you one example from a paper published from, from a researcher in Mainz, from Jos Lelifeld in Nature, the contribution of outdoor air pollution sources to premature mortality on a global scale. So when here are the top 15 ranked countries of premature mortality linked to outdoor air pollution in 2010, and you see that residential energy is in for the world mostly responsible for the excess mortality. But the interesting point is when you compare India to Germany, yeah, you see in India 50% residential energy is important for the excess mortality. In Germany, it's agriculture. So over fertilization is a very important point being responsible that so many people are die because of, um, let's say, particulate matter formed during this over fertilization uh, procedure. And there's another important manuscript published in Environmental Science and Technology, comparing the particulate matter generated in Beijing and on a Swiss farm. And the interesting point is that the stuff which was generated in a Swiss farm was more toxic than the particulate matter produced in Beijing. So, and will determine if the research in future um, that we determine not just the size of the particle, the stuff which is sitting on the particle is the one which decides to what degree we are getting sick or not. Now with respect to cardiovascular disease and air pollution, we know that, for example, particulate matter can cause an increase in stress hormone release. It can also increase cholesterol levels and diabetes and cause uh, glucose levels increases. And it can, as I showed to you before, by uh, going directly into the brain, arterial hypertension. Now, I showed you before that the WHO calculated 4.2 million excess deaths per year uh, for the whole world. And um, we just did a paper in two years ago, which was published in the European Heart Journal, having new data, more data, more information about high level um, air pollution and low level air pollution. And the important point was here, so you see in the map, excess death in Europe, that Jos Lelefeld calculated that almost 800,000 people, excess death occur due to ambient air pollution per year in Europe. Importantly, he also increased the numbers for the entire world from 
4.2 to 7.2. And this calculation was actually first made by Richard Burnett in Canada, and it was secondarily confirmed by, by Jos Lellifeld. An important point is it's not kidney disease, uh, which is the most important, it's ischemic heart disease, 40%. If 8% stroke, we have then around 20% of uh, pulmonary disease and so-called 32% other non-communicable diseases. And this includes, includes kidney disease, also arterial hypertension and uh, diabetes mellitus. And when we look for the death per 100,000 in, in Europe, it's really disappointing that Germany actually has a very high number much higher than, for example, uh, in Italy, in, in the United Kingdom or in France. So what is the worldwide perspective? And this was again, Jos Lelifeld who calculated the loss of life expectancy in response to ambient air pollution. And he calculated 2.9 years for the entire world. Tobacco smoking, that's very interesting, uh, acknowledged cardiovascular risk factors reduces our life expectancy just by 2.2 years, HIV AIDS by 0.7 years, and, and all form of violence, including wars, by 0.3 years. So we got a nice headline in the Times, dirty air is deadlier than war, AIDS, and smoking combined. And as you can see from the data, again, ischemic heart disease is dominating cerebrovascular disease, stroke, uh, is dominating, making almost 40 to 45 uh, percent of all excess deaths. And you can also see that mostly the elderly people are involved. The only exception is Africa, which actually shows that, especially because of the high levels of air pollution, uh, young children are getting more pneumonia and at the end are dying because of these high um, air pollution levels in, in, in the middle of Africa. Another important uh, publication from Jos Lelifeld was that air pollution versus prognosis of COVID infected patients. And <clears throat> you know that COVID attacks the lungs and it also attacks the cardiovascular system. So we know that uh, the virus is taken up by the cells by the ACE2 receptor in the epithelium of the lungs and in the endothelium of the vasculature. So, it's not a surprise when you have a lot of air pollution and you have, in addition, a COVID infection that the mortality rate will go up. So this was published first by Wu and co-workers and Francesca Dominici from the Harvard Clinic. And uh, then this was just data for the US and we published data uh, worldwide. Actually, we could demonstrate 15% um, of uh, the death caused by COVID uh, uh, infections are uh, produced by having high air pollution exposure. So I told you that one explanation maybe is that, that the particle acts as a virus spreader. Now air pollution and kidney disease. Now you can see everything which I showed you in the cartoon before. It's causing a disturbance of the autonomic nervous system. It's actually a nice, very nice review in, in, uh, in nature, it causes inflammatory responses, endothelial dysfunction, blood pressure increases, uh, nitric oxide excretion goes down, we get more diabetes, insulin resistance, oxidative stress, which I like very much because it's my research topic. Then you get vascular damage, intraglomerular hypertension, glomerular sclerosis, tubulohistal damage, and then chronic kidney disease progression. So we have this um, two examples which confirm that air pollution, it's, it's also in Nature Review and Cardiology by Chinese group, more inflammation and oxidative stress. So it's always the same, whether we're talking about the vasculature or the kidney, you get endothelial dysfunction and circulating autoantibodies of against phospholipase A2 uh, are important. And we have this kind of uh, some intoxication by the environment, cadmium, lead, lead, mercury, and arsenic, but which is not actually the topic of this talk. And we know that long-term exposure to air pollution increased risk of membranes, nephropathy increases in China. So, so I think it's just an expression that 
that air pollution and here in particular the particulate matter 2.5 or maybe ultra fine particulate matter causing inflammation in, in all organs, um, whether it's the heart or the brain or the kidney leading uh, to damage, which at the end, uh, of course, has very important prognostic implications. So we need a reduction of environmental pollutants for, for the prevention of cardiovascular, but also for renal disease. We have the air pollution, we have the noise, and I think it's time to act, five minutes to 12. And of course, there are many solutions available actually, which may help uh, to avoid uh, uh, cardiovascular side effects uh, in future. Now, first of all, we need no limits, lower limits because the WHO asks for 10 microgram per cubic meter uh, particulate matter levels. They say below it's safe, higher it's dangerous, endangering our uh, health. In Europe, we have a limit of 25 microgram per cubic meter, unbelievable high. Yeah? In USA, we have 12 microgram per cubic meter. And just coming down to the USA levels, which mean we would halven the mortality in Europe by 50%. So from 800,000 people down to 400,000 people. There are some publications existing demonstrating this. Australia has eight, WHO recommends 10, and Canada has also 10. So European Union has a big task to do. Emission control is a very effective in intervention. The aims are well below 10 microgram per cubic meter. And just consider a phase out of fossil fuel related emissions, which means get rid of oil, gas, and coal would help us to reach the, the two degrees Celsius climate change goal on, under the Paris Agreement. And this would save 440,000 lives, incredible number. It would increase life expectancy by 1.2 years and it would reduce mortality in Europe by 55%. So everybody's talking about Corona and uh, incredible numbers. So I think we have worldwide now 4 million people that are dying because of Corona. And we know that almost nine people, are, nine million people are dying because of particulate matter or air pollution. There was just a paper published in America, from the American Heart Association, personal level protective actions against particulate matter, air pollution exposure. What can we do on ourselves uh, to avoid particulate matter induced damage? So for example, we can take pharmacological agents I'm pretty convinced that statins, 81 receptor blocker, or ACE inhibitors are helpful because they are very important antioxidants and, and oxidative stress actually is the, the, the main killer uh, in response to particulate matter. Maybe we can do exercise, but the problem is when we do exercise and we have a high degree of air pollution outside, are we doing something good to our vasculature or are we killing ourselves? And uh, there is actually a very new study which is just in press from the European Heart Channel. On the left-hand side, you see exercise done during very low levels of PM 2.5 or PM 10. You see if you reduce exercise, the hazard ratio goes up. So you're dying more because of heart disease and stroke. And when you do exercise, you can prevent exercise and stroke. But the problem is when you have high levels of air pollution, which, which means more than 25 microgram per cubic meter, um, you don't reduce the risk, you increase your risk. So this is a very first study determining exactly what is the level of air pollution outside in response to um, 2.5 uh, particulate matter concentrations, which is actually damaging you if you do exercise. An important point is we have now some tools which help us uh, to decide whether I should do exercise or stay in bed and do nothing. So you can have um, a smartphone, you can get data from, from uh, GPS information, you can get information about noise and PM 2.5 um, concentrations and actually some apps are telling you um, green light, you can go outside and do exercise, or red light, stay at home, do nothing. Now, I must admit, my, my first interest was always uh, noise, and, and we started with noise research in 2011, 
here, um, we just had a paper published a few weeks ago in, in Nature Review, Cardiology, Transportation Noise Pollution and Cardiovascular Disease. And the problem was simply that uh, I'm living close to Frankfurt and the Frankfurt airport actually uh, is something which I don't like very much because we have many airplanes and uh, these guys make me nervous. They stress me and maybe they cause uh, cardiovascular disease. Let me start with a very nice sentence from um, Robert Koch. One day, men will have to fight noise as fiercely as cholera and plague. And this was from 1912. Unbelievable. So he's the founder of the modern bacteriology. He got the Nobel Prize for that in 1905. And I think just for this sentence, he deserves actually another Nobel Prize. The WHO says that at least 1.6 million healthy life years are lost every year from traffic related noise. 70 million Europeans and towns and cities are exposed to noise levels excess of 55 decibels, which are known that above these levels you are getting sick. For example, um, you have healthy years lost, 61,000 per year from uh, ischemic heart disease. You have a cognitive impairment uh, of children. You have almost one million healthy years lost uh, for sleep disturbance and 650,000 years for, for annoyance development. And the question is, how is noise making us sick? Uh, it's, it's a very, let's say, new concept, which was summarized in 2014 by our group. And the important point is we have two pathways, the so-called direct pathway, where we have very high noise levels, which are going above 90, 100 decibel, which are destroying our hearing organ. Or we have the indirect pathway, which is much more important, which means we have decibel levels between 50 and 60. So you get a disturbance of activity, sleep and communication. You just get annoyance or you get angry. Yeah, and you develop stress. And the important point is, is characterized, you know, that by increased um, cortisone levels and increased um, sympathetic nervous system. And the important point is when we have chronic stress, then we develop our own cardiovascular risk factors. Blood pressure goes up, blood lipids go up, blood glucose goes up mainly because of the high circulating cortisone levels, get an activation of blood clotting factors and uh, blood viscosity also goes up. And if you have this for years, you get the typical cardiovascular diseases, stroke, heart failure, ischemic heart disease, but also cardiovascular arrhythmia. And the, the question always was, when you have chronic stress and at the end you get cardiovascular disease, what happens in between? What is the pathophysiology between noise-induced cardiovascular stress and atherosclerosis? Now, first of all, it's very important whether you're getting annoyed by noise or not. Yeah, Here you, for example, see a nice study published in European Heart Journal. And you see here in the noise level, 65 decibel. You see here railway noise, road, road noise, and aircraft noise. Here the decibel levels, and here the highly annoyed levels in present. And that's what stated by all studies, whether it's epidemiological or studies or laboratory studies, aircraft noise is most annoying, followed by road noise and followed by railway noise. And the important point is now to know if you're getting annoyed by noise, does this has consequences for the cardiovascular prognosis? And there's a beautiful paper published in European Heart Journal last year from the group in Harvard, a neurobiological mechanism linking transportation noise to cardiovascular disease in humans. And what they did in 500 subjects is to measure the amygdala activity. Amygdala is a part of the limbic system, which is important um, for anxiety responses or emotional responses uh, in humans. And what they have shown actually, when you have noise, if you have increased noise exposure that you get, first of all, using this fluorodeoxyglucose PET CT, that you get an activation of your amygdala. So the amygdala activity goes up but they've seen on the same time signs for vascular inflammation. So when you have noise and you're getting annoyed, you will have, have vascular inflammation. 
if you have low level of nerves, you get not an activation of amygdala and you have no inflammation of your uh, vasculature. Here you see again that, that the higher the noise, the higher the amygdala activity. And of course, it makes sense. And uh, this kaplan meyer curve showing when we have higher levels of noise that uh, our cardiovascular maze, which means stroke, myocardial infarction, and death to myocardial infarction, that your prognosis is worse compared to people having less high uh, noise levels. It's also important this annoyance can cause um, arrhythmia and cerebral, cerebral disease. For example, when we have more uh, annoyance to noise, that the likelihood of atrial fibrillation is increased, which explains at the end why we get more stroke. And it's also important that noise annoyance is associated with depression and anxiety, so which means the more uh, annoyance is existing, uh, for example, extreme annoyance, it's causing almost a doubling of um, uh, the um, existence of, an, of a depression. So this, these are very important risk factors also for cerebral disease. And of course, it can cause hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, uh, and stroke. And I just want to put your attention to a study which was published um, 2008. It's a European multi-airport study, which nicely showed when you have nighttime noise that the increase in blood pressure, the, the, the odds ratio goes up when you have nighttime noise, but it's not significant when you have daytime noise. So which means when you have interrupted sleep, too short sleep, and if you have stress because um, you cannot sleep, that the likelihood to get cardiovascular disease is clearly increased. Now the question is, how is noise causing cardiovascular disease? And I'm a big fan of endothelial function measurements. I don't know how familiar you are, you are with this kind of measurements. It gives you an information about the release of nitric oxide from the endothelium. So what we did is we measured endothelial function in, in a field study, which means that subjects were exposed to aircraft noise in their house, in their sleeping room. So it was not in laboratory condition, it was in the house. That's why it's called a field study that 30 or 60 flights per night. Here so you can see the, the rhythm. And we measured endothelial function before and after noise exposure. And we also combined this with Somnovatch Plus measurements, which means polygraphic screening devices, which gives us information about heart rate, blood pressure, and for example, sympathetic activation of the vasculature. What we've seen is that in normal medical students, one night, 30 noise events or 60 noise events are causing endothelial dysfunction. And this is getting improved about vitamin C, indicating that the high oxidative stress level occurs in response to this nighttime aircraft noise. We have also seen that the pulse transit time goes down, which means this reflects sympathetic activation. And we've also seen that adrenaline level uh, rise significantly. The important point is when we have coronary artery disease, the deterioration of endothelial function is much stronger compared to healthy subjects. That's also important. So when you have cardiovascular risk factors, you have, you have bad endothelial function and you have noise in addition, you will react with endothelial dysfunction. And we had a nice editorial actually, which suggested when we have our aircraft noise, then we get st stress hormone release we get endothelial dysfunction, which means the nitric oxide synthase is getting dysfunctional and we have a so-called NADPH oxidase. I don't know whether you have heard about this enzyme before, but it's also important for, for kidney function. Then we have less nitric oxide, more suboxide, and it's causing more contraction, less vasodilation, and also more atherosclerosis. Because of this editorial, we decided then to develop an animal model. So we exposed mice to, to noise, 85 decibel peak levels, and we exposed mice for one, two, and four days um, to noise. And we used for comparison to aircraft noise, identical mean sound pressure levels of white noise. And we had a 
very interesting article published in European Heart Journal in, in 2017, and we could show what we expected, that noise increases blood pressure. We have seen an increase in noradrenaline, dopamine, NH2, and in adrenaline. We have seen endothelial dysfunction. I don't know whether you know the technique. So we can take out the aorta and stimulate the, the vessel with acetylcholine, which causes a receptor-dependent nitric oxide release. So we have seen one day, or let's say 24 hours of noise, is causing endothelial dysfunction, which means the vessel is releasing less NO. And we could confirm this by measuring uh, the NO levels in the, in the vasculature. Uh, which was highly interesting. And we've seen that oxidative stress goes up. Yeah. So nitrotyrosine occurs mainly when nitric oxide reacts with superoxide to form peroxynitride. And you can see a very brown staining already after two and four days. So we have high levels of oxidative stress. And at the same time, we have seen that endothelin staining goes up uh, tremendously. So we have more endothelin expression and more vasoconstriction, which of course explain in part the very high blood pressure. Interestingly, white noise using the same sound pressure levels has no negative effect at all. So it's mainly the aircraft noise level which is doing so bad. So we postulated then that um, aircraft noise is causing the release of, of stress hormones and causing all this negative impact on vascular function. It increases oxidative stress, so we have less NO. Um, and the important point is we also showed that in the vasculature of noise exposed animals, we have many more macrophages. So NOx2, which is this NADPH oxidase subunit in inflammatory cells is highly upregulated in these noise exposed animals. So future studies also in humans showed that nighttime noise is really a problem. So when we have nighttime noise, blood pressure goes up. When we have daytime noise, it's not a problem. So the, and, and this makes sense because uh, like demonstrated by Capuccio, um, it's really clear that the sleep duration uh, predicts cardiovascular outcomes. So we know when you have less than six hours of sleep that at the end, uh, cardiovascular effects, side effects are much more frequent. So we have more cardiovascular death, more arterial hypertension, more arrhythmia, and also more heart failure. So we did then the next investigation, daytime versus nighttime noise, just to make a long story short, when we have nighttime noise, we get endothelial dysfunction, we get an increase in blood pressure, and we get more endothelial expression. When we have nighttime noise, we don't see it when we have daytime noise. And the important point is also, when we look, for example, for the neuronal noise, which is responsible for, for memory and learning, that we can get already within a very short time frame of aircraft noise, a down regulation of this very important enzyme which also play, explains in part why children, for example, have a problem in cognitive development uh, when they live in very noisy areas. That's a study from Heathrow, which showed that noise annoyance, which goes up with the decibel levels, leads to, leads to a significant reduction in reading capacity of the children. So this is a very important information and we with our down regulation of neural nerves can actually explain this very important findings. So I showed you now examples for pollutant emissions and for noise and how we can fight it at the end. We have to fight it. In, in my mind, it's five minutes to 12. And um, the important point is that actually with COVID, we have a situation right now where we have uh, much less air pollution, we have much less noise. And now the Sustainability is the very important point. Now coming to the last point, heart healthy cities. And I want to convince you that we have to focus on city design just to have a, a very healthy fu uh, future. Two thirds of the European population live in urban areas and this number of course continues to grow and the world population is estimated to reach 10 billion people by 2050 and 75% of those will live in cities. 
60 to 80 percent of final energy use globally is consumed by urban areas and 17 percent of greenhouse gas emissions are produced within cities so city planning is now recognized as part of a comprehensive solution to tackle adverse health outcomes and the who is stating because of the high number of people living in cities healthy urban planning is about planning for people and here you see the urban risk exposures which leads at the end to cardiovascular disease, we have traffic, we have air pollution, we have noise, but we have also social isolation, problems with personal safety, physical inactivity, prolonged sitting, and unhealthy diet. This was a very nice article published um, in the Lancet, and I just want to mention uh, some new aspects. For example, a paper published last year in European Heart Journal showing that slight increases in, in the temperature um, at the end increases the likelihood um, of myocardial infarction in patients with hyperlipidemia and diabetes mellitus. So cold is a problem, but also too high temperature is a problem. And this is also summarized in the so-called heat island effect. It's a consequence when wooded or green areas are getting removed and replaced by concrete and asphalt. And it's, it's very interesting that we have in some cities temperature different differences for up to three to five degrees Celsius. We see more hospital admissions and more cardiovascular uh, complications. So we need to generate more green space. And there are actually, like you see on the right side, many studies showing if you make uh, your jogging activities through uh, parks or if you uh, enjoy several times per week uh, green space that you are um, let's say cardiovascular prognosis is uh, clearly better uh, compared to those not going uh, into parks. And another important point is that uh, nocturnal light pollution is a very novel cardiovascular risk factor. We had the, um, the chance to write a nice editorial to that. And I just want to put your attention to, to East uh, America, where you see the light pollution, which um, is translated here into a higher cardiovascular risk, but at the same time, we have more air pollution and we have more noise pollution. So this is something we have to focus on future our research that we have to combine the cardiovascular side effects of these environmental stressors. Now, what, what can help us personally to fight these challenges. So we have more, everybody has a smartphone and there are more apps available. They can give you actually a very nice information whether you can do exercise outside or not. So it's giving you a green light when they say air pollution is not so strong so that you can do a regular exercise or please stay at home and uh, don't move because the air pollution concentration uh, is too high. It's also important that we get away from studying the one exposure, one health outcome association. So a new paradigm has developed the so-called exposome. This in, envisages complex multi-level pathways and interactions with other environmental, socioeconomic, social and lifestyle factors and genetics. and comprises processes internal to our body, metabolism, endogenous circulating hormones, physical activity, gut microflora, inflammation, lipid peroxidation, oxidative stress, and aging. And this is, um, let's say, a cartoon we just made where we summarize that we, of course, have our classical health risk factors, overnutrition, hypertension, hyperglycemia, but we also have the external exposome, like smoking, psychosocial stress, you have noise, UV irritation, and of course, uh, air pollution. An important point is, that the external exposome and the classical risk factors have the, the same mechanism which at the end may cause cardiovascular uh, side effects and causing mainly cardiovascular disease. And at the end, I like to uh, say you one sentence, which I like very much actually, genetic loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I, I like a lot the the last slide. No, it's 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 really real because you have the feeling, no, that you already have the background, but genetic right. will set it up. No, 
So I have a question for you. And um, what's worse, the pollution, the air pollution or the sound pollution? That's a very important question. So if we just um, got the availability of a device which allows us to expose mice to, to mm -hmm. aircraft noise, and we can also put polluted air into the cage. So we can study the combined effects of noise and air pollution. And the interesting point is we have additive effects. And we also see that the, let's say, the way they cause oxidative stress in the vasculature, in the heart or in, in the brain is exactly the same when you use uh, air pollution, 2.5 micro, uh, microgram, or if you use noise. So, so that, that's what we hypothesize that air pollution and noise are doing cardiovascular side effects by the same pathophysiological mechanism. That's disturbing because um, on the other hand, if we fight both efficiently, then we, we can avoid this uh, health side effects. And, and were you able to study, to study the kidneys? No, In actually not. Okay, so not. maybe we could do, could do something because maybe we can study oxidative stress in these kidneys and it's also modified. Yeah, this is a very, very important issue. So um, I was screening the literature, was a little bit disappointed that with respect to the kidney, not very much is, is done so far. Um, with respect to noise, to my knowledge, there are not many groups actually um, being involved in noise research, which is very good for us because we don't have many competitors in research. But um, I think this, this air pollution research has to be intensified by, very, very strongly. And um, it's a huge area. We have thousands of questions and, and uh, uh, I'm pretty convinced that, that the air pollution, for example, is at least as important as uh, other cardiovascular risk factors or risk factors for the kidney function and um, just have to study it. There's a huge, let's say, um, yeah, need to do that. Can I, can I ask you a, a question from the, the audience? So um, we're being asked about face masks. So is, is there evidence that wearing a face mask reduces your exposure to air pollution and therefore reduces your cardiovascular risk? Uh, um, I think that's what I expect, actually. I don't know whether studies exist, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that by removing these particles that your cardiovascular prognosis will improve, of course. Yeah. And so then, um, so I'd like to know, do you, do you think we've got our focus wrong? So I'm in, I'm in the UK, and in the UK, with lockdown, there's been quite a big drive to improve um, cycling, so um, to try and make sure we have cycle lanes and to try and encourage people to to cycle to work rather than to take a car or public transport. But do you think that what we should really be doing is suggesting that people exercise, but only once they have access to an app or a sensor to tell them when's the best time to be going outside rather than, you know, first thing in the morning or during the shower? Yeah, I think that's very important because, um, as I said, the smartphones deliver the information we need now because we have these stations measuring um, air pollution uh, all over the place. And, and um, I think it can help you decide uh, whether you go out and do biking or not. I think that's, the, that's very important and that's actually the future. So I'm, I'm excited about this study, which I was mentioning because this 25 microgram per cubic meter, if you do it three times a week for 90 minutes, yeah. uh, that the cardiovascular prognosis deteriorates. It's very funny for me because uh, 25 microgram per cubic meter, it's actually a level of air pollution which is still allowed in Europe. So why is America having 12 and Europe is having 25? Because we have all this lobby stuff, you know, that um, reducing air pollution from 25 to 12 means a lot of investigation, investment in the, into companies to reduce um, the emissions and all this stuff. So I think that a strong lobby is still pre preventing that we, we reduce air pollution levels in Europe. So it's interesting that Trump country, if you want, has 12 and, and Europe has 25. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, my impression very much is that it's not high on the government agendas. Um, so my impression very much is the focus is on things like exercise, diet, you know, stopping smoking. But the, the focus certainly doesn't seem to be on you know, reducing air pollution, which clearly it should be, because you've demonstrated beautifully what a, a significant risk factor it is. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm really surprised. Uh, so I was looking at the I think he's gone, Kate. No, I think we've lost him. Oh, no, he's uh, prevention cardiology is very important uh, risk risk factor. So um problem, the problem is you, you, you yes, froze slightly okay. there. You you froze, so we missed the first part of what you had to say. I wonder if you could repeat it. Yeah, so that, that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm very disappointed that um, air pollution is not mentioned in the guidelines. And so when cardiologists are writing guidelines, these are just cardiologists. So what we need is atmospheric chemists and which have some idea about air pollution or toxicologists, which tell you starting from which concentration the cardiovascular system uh, is having a problem. And so it's funny that we have such a major killer like air pollution and prevention guidelines are not mentioning it because it's a risk factor which cannot be influenced by doctors or patients, but rather by politicians making law which protect us from cardiovascular side effects from, from this air pollution. That's very important. So I think the guidelines team has to be extended. People understanding air pollution and noise have to be included. And what about some research um, over the course of the last 14 months or so when air pollution and noise pollution presumably has been better in most places because of lockdown? Actually, the, com the, the connection is not, not very strong, oh, so, but... Did you hear me? Um, the, so, so there are some paper published also from Jos Lelefeld in Mainz, showing that during uh, the lockdown period, uh, mm. over a time from four months uh, in China and India, 50,000 lives, lives are saved. Within four months, 50,000 lives are saved because of the reduction in air pollutant levels. And many children don't have to go to the emergency department because of asthma attacks. So, so there's a huge, huge effect of um, the current situation. And my problem is when everybody has uh, his vaccine, then we start all over again. Yeah, you can vaccinate against um, COVID, but not against air pollution. So that's our ne next task. So we, we need strong politician. I don't know how strong your big boss is. <laughs> I feel not so strong, <laughs> but this is something we have to tell the people, try to keep the situation like it is now. Because when, like I said, when we make a phase out of, of fossil fuel, no gas, no oil, no coals, then we can reach until to the end of the century plus two degree, yeah? And Kerry, uh, who is coming back to the Paris Agreement from, from Biden, He's saying in, in America, they calculate already with an increase of 3.8 degree until to the end of century, which would be a disaster. So we, we have to fight now. And I think the medical society is very important because we can tell the people when you are above this concentration, you're getting sick. Maybe the politicians listen more to us than to other people because I think, um, the data are clear. We have, we have the data clearly showing from which concentration are you getting sick. And just remember that uh, Paul Krutzen, uh, he's, he was uh, the one, the guy before Jos Lelefeld in mind, he got the Nobel Prize for the ozone hole. So, so he realized that fluorocore, um, these, these um, special substances are responsible for the ozone hole. For, they were forbidden and the whole ozone hole is closed now. We understand everything, we have the data, now we have to react and have to make pressure on politicians. That's very important. So let's ask you a personal question. How do you live your life to minimize your exposure to air pollution and noise pollution? Talk oh. me through a day in, in <laughs> Professor Munzel's life so he doesn't get exposed to too much pollution from the noise. Uh, that's, that's, that's a very important question. Uh, so my first consequences were that I'm using now uh, e-cars, electric electronic cars, which may be, uh, it's reducing noise and uh, it's reducing pollution. I think that's, that's a very important point. And um, of course, what I'm doing is also giving a lot of lectures like this here to, to tell the people what the problem is. Yeah, because um, I think it's very important to make, uh, uh, to, to 
bring the people to more attention to, to the environment. And my, my hope is also that more people are doing environmental research. So the, the interesting point is we're doing this noise research since 2011 and no other group is joining. So we can publish in European Heart Journal with a very high impact in, in nature everywhere, but nobody's joining us because it's not so easy to integrate the environment into your vascular biology research. So, so you have to use, you need a very strong engineering uh, system, which this is supporting you. Yeah. So if, if any nephrologist is, listen, is listening an, at us, what do you recommend for us to do in research, in, in green nephrology and research? What, what will be the easy point? Because sometimes now they, they are environment, environmental things that we cannot modify. So what will you recommend? We know about the kidneys, but imagine that we don't know about em environment. What do you recommend for us? Yeah, so I, I think uh, for, for uh, nephrologists being very active in basic science, they should adapt the, the different uh, models. They should invest into machines which are able to generate particulate matter different sizes. Um, um, we have a machine from, from um, T systems, which um, uh, at the end um, costs, I, I think, four to 500,000 euro. Um, and this machine can also generate particulate matter, ultra fine particulate matter. And this is a very question for the future. So everybody's talking about ultra fine particles, but nobody knows what ultra fine particles are doing. We, we know it's the penetration is stronger, it, it goes more easily to the brain, to the vessels, uh, but we don't know whether it's causing more inflammation. Is, is ultrafine really more toxic than, than the 2.5? This, this is something which is very important and we always have to, to look at the environmental stressors together. So when, when you study noise, uh, road noise, then we have also air pollution. When you study aircraft noise, you also have pollution with ultrafine particles. It's very important to, to um, study the risk factors, the environmental risk factors on its own, but also the combination of all together. Yeah. For example, this external light, this artificial light and, and the air pollution and noise together, because I believe they have additive or even exponential uh, negative effects on, on our health. In terms of um, the, the sort of optimal level of, of pollution or the, or the optimal yeah. level of, of no pollution. So obviously you've said that who suggested 10 micrograms per uh, meter. Yeah, that's right, W to O, yeah, that's yeah. right. Do you actually think it should be less than that? I mean, what would you say was the as low as possible or do you have an, another figure that you think- that's, would be a, that's a very important question because we have new studies clearly showing that even below 10, uh, you are not safe, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's also the reason why Jos Lelefeld and, and Burnett increased the numbers from 4.2 million per year to almost eight to nine million per year because they have new data with very high concentrations of particulate matter. And these studies were not available, let's say five to seven years ago. So the people were interpolating the data from, from tobacco smoking. And, and here usually there was leveling off at, at, at a certain PM concentration, but now we see it's linear. The higher the concentration, the stronger the cardiovascular side effects. And we know that even go below 10, uh, it's dangerous uh, for our health. So I think uh, the, the particulate matter concentrations have to be uh, as low as possible. And uh, the interesting point to me is also that air pollution is killing more people than tobacco smoking. So that's... It's a very important risk factors. And what I like to have is actually uh, what we see every day from, from John Hopkins, this uh, very nice um, coronavirus statistics. Yeah, So I like to have at the end of the year, 9 million deaths uh, due to air pollution. And in Europe, we have so many and in America has so many. So the pollution this is something statistics. which would be awesome. That's you right. You want to see the pollution, pollution statistics. statistics every year. Yeah. Yeah, I want to see that every year and, and uh, if politicians see that and acknowledge that um, air pollution is a very important risk factor, which is shortening our life, maybe even more than 
um, other classical risk factors, then maybe more intention or money is um, um, put into uh, environmental research. And that's also a big problem because when, when I'm doing research, and then they ask me, what are you doing? Studying uh, air pollution and noise. Oh, that for the pharmaceutical industry, that's not interesting. And, and it's very hard to get funding for, for this very important question. So this is also something which should overtake the European Union, making big grants for this kind of basic science research because it's still unique. Just a few groups are doing it and it has a huge social impact. So one of our um, attendees has suggested a pollution meter. And I guess just following on from what you said, what about getting the app and sensor companies um, to you? Presumably, um, if that was publicized, mm. they, could, they could be used for funding, couldn't they? If we could get everybody wanting about with a, an app for levels of pollution. Mm. Uh, that's very important. So um, maybe if you have the time, go into the internet and look for reviews from uh, Neuvenhusen. It's, it's um, I think he's from the Netherlands. He's living in Barcelona and he has beautiful um, reviews and, and original articles about uh, urban healthy city design. And so healthy city design, mm -hmm. that's really the future. And if you consider that 80% of all people are living in cities, it's, it's very clear to me uh, where the, our future health is produced. It's in our cities, the city designers is very important and um, he has beautiful ideas how to construct streets and, and to mix between um, let's say concrete and, and, and green um, uh, parks and, and all this stuff so the, the, that's really and actually I I got just in European Heart Journal a very nice article accepted which we may see in two or three months about heart healthy city design it's it's really um, it was not my topic and I was forced to make a presentation at the European Heart Meeting. And I said, oh, I'm not an architecture actually. So why should me as a cardiologist talk about heart healthy cities? But it was a beautiful topic. So I learned a lot. And, and I think our future is, is, is a healthy city design. It's a very important that we move a lot. It's like Copenhagen. Copenhagen is uh, so far, let's say a model for the healthiest city in Europe. So you just see bikes over there. You don't see cars, you see a lot of green space. And, and um, Copenhagen is for me, let's say a typical city like the future, uh, future cities should be designed actually, yeah. Green in the rough tubes, no? I have this feeling that is moving in the buildings. You have to have a lot of green in the buildings. Yeah. Yeah, like rooftop. Yeah, I think that's very important. So. The first point is you have to show that if you exchange uh, green green space uh, to, to concrete, that this is a problem that you, you have to statistic, you need your studies to show that um, people are dying more, that higher temperature is, is a very important risk factor. Outdoor light is another risk factor. So, so um, we are, and we are focusing in our guidelines just on cholesterol and, and blood pressure and diabetes and all this stuff. This is not the future. So the people have to acknowledge the environment pulls the trigger. That's very important. The environment is killing us. Yeah. yeah. Not not the quality. But yeah. all the energy, all the funding, it's all put into this traditional old cardiovascular risk factors. And this makes no sense anymore. Yeah, so if, if um, you, we remember nothing, we should remember your last your last slide. So I think we're almost um, at the uh, out of time. And you know that in advance, people had submitted some questions. So I think you answered the vast majority of them with your presentation. But there is there is one. Um, so asking if there's any open access database for environmental epidemiology analyses um, on cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease. Do you know, I, I suspect the answer is no. There's no database for environmental epidemiology. No, no, no database, no database, no, no. Okay, so Maria, is there anything else you want to say? No, I thank you for this presentation. That was really nice. We enjoy a lot about a topic that we don't know a lot, that is unknown. And thank you very much for the nice presentation this yeah. afternoon. Thank you very thank much. You. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for your interest. Thank very you. Good. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.